I am Rachel Werner, the Executive Director of Leonard uh, Davis Institute of Health Economics, which is Penn's hub for research on policy, healthcare delivery, and population health. Welcome to LDI's kickoff virtual seminar for this fall. For many years here at LDI, we've hosted a seminar series on Fridays at noon where we meet in the Colonial Penn Center, which is LDI's building on Penn's campus. We have lunch and we hear from national experts in health policy and, and their research. Last spring, however, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we pivoted and began hosting virtual conversations with small panels of experts covering a range of topics about current headlines in healthcare. What these sessions may have lacked in free lunch, I think they made up for um, in timely conversations about relevant topics that directly inform today's most pressing questions in health and healthcare. So I'm very excited to kick off this fall's virtual seminar series with today's very timely conversation and with the tremendous experts that we have joining us today. There's a lot to talk about, so without further ado, let's get started. Joining us today, we have Daniel Dawes, who is Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and Executive Director of Government Relations, Policy, and External Affairs at the Morehouse School of Medicine. He is a nationally recognized scholar and leader in health equity and social justice and founded the National Working Group on Health Disparities and Health Reform. We have Erica Franklin Fowler, who is a professor of government at Wesleyan University. She's one of the nation's leading experts on large scale and real time analyses of political and health related communication and serves on the ABC News election night decision desk. Andy Slavitt is a former acting administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where he oversaw Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, and led the turnaround of healthcare.gov and led the implementation of many of the ACA programs. Rodney Whitlock is the vice president of McDermott Consulting, where he advises businesses on Medicare and Medicaid. He has more than 20 years of experience on Capitol Hill, serving as health policy advisor and director for the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley, and is the lead Republican staffer for Medicaid legislation. And then today's panel will be moderated by Penn's Ezekiel Emanuel. Um, Zeke is the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives and the Diane V. S. Levy and Robert M. Levy University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. During the Obama administration, he served as Special Advisor for Health Policy to the Director of the Office of Budget in the White House. So, Zeke, with that, I will turn it over to you. This is, as you point out, uh, an august panel, uh, perfectly uh, selected to address uh, critical issues in the last uh, 40 days or so before uh, a momentous election, or as someone has said, an election for the soul of the country. So, uh, uh, Erica uh, Fowler, let me begin with you and ask, in the last 40 days, how much do you think healthcare is going to define the campaign? And looking beyond uh, November 3rd, how much do you think healthcare is actually going to shape uh, the president's agenda, whomever that is, both in terms of COVID, but also in terms of non-COVID issues? Yeah, thank you for that question. I do think that one of the many ways that we can think about upcoming political priorities is through topics that candidates reference in their campaign ads. This is what they run on. They're paying money for these messages. And so if we think about what they say in those, if we take what they say in those ads seriously, as what, uh, what their priorities will be measured through that lens, every indicator suggests that healthcare will continue to be a top priority. I thought it might be useful to put a little historical context uh, on this frame that after the Affordable Care Act passage, Democrats barely referenced the law in campaign ads all the way up through the 2016 election. It wasn't until the 2018 cycle that you actually saw Democrats come back and start talking about healthcare in a real way, and they were laser focused on it. So much so that over 50% of their ads were about healthcare, which is really something we haven't seen in a very long time. Republicans, on the other hand, post ACA passage were solely focused on the message of repeal and replace uh, in about 30% of their ads following passage. Of course, that changes also in the 2018 cycle because they uh, have to replace the repeal and replace message in the sense that they had an opportunity to do so and, and weren't unable to do that. 
but they definitely did not ignore healthcare in the 2018 cycle either. About a third of their, their ads were on this topic. And healthcare was certainly a top issue for voters pre-pandemic this year. COVID and economic messages sort of took over during the summer, but between August and early September, healthcare was a focus of over a third of Biden's ads and pro-democratic Senate ads. And they were even over a quarter of Trump's ads and 20% of pro-Republican Senate ads. So certainly there, even with COVID and economic messages at the top of the list, uh, healthcare certainly is not being ignored. And the new Supreme Court vacancy during the middle of a pandemic is only gonna exacerbate that attention. So far I'm making predictions and our the Wesley Media Project will be out with an updated release next week. So stay tuned, uh, but I would, I would guess that healthcare attention is only going to increase from here on out. And can you just make one more link and or tell me that that link is wrong? To the extent that it's a high purchase and the focus of the election, does that carry over into policy once someone is elected? So if Joe Biden got, gets elected and so much money is being spent on health care ads, that means he has to do something about health care. He will perforce devote a lot of attention to it because there are a lot of competing demands. There's climate change. There's the relationship with China. There's the economy. Lots of competing demands, you're absolutely right. But I also think that it, it, to the extent that these messages are campaign promises, that I will work on these issues, they are also then come back to, to you know, campaigns, that opponents and the public will come back to those top issues in the next election cycle. You ran on these sets of issues, what have you done about that? So they do, the extent to which a candidate references and talks more about one particular issue does raise the stakes for that particular candidate in the, the subsequent election. So let's switch to Rodney Whitlock, uh, a man who uh, I've known for a while, although we haven't connected uh, recently. And as you heard, uh, has advised uh, a very intimate understanding of the Republican side of the Hill. Um, in your view, if President Trump gets reelected, what can we expect uh, on health care uh, in the next year? And, and I would ask in particular, we, last night we saw this big, dramatic executive set of executive orders around pre-existing conditions, um, reminiscent of the big announcement prior to 2018 about drug prices. Do we think he's going to follow through with something substantial? Well, you know, thankfully they did my job for me last night. So I just get to go, well, read last night. Why do you need to talk to me? Um, okay, let me paint a picture for you. And this is the way I want you to think about it, because I, I think it's helpful. Listen, if 2017 and re repeal and replace is, and then the administration's position on California versus Texas, if that's all you need to know, then again, it's not a long conversation. But to look at what the administration has really done over the last four years paints a much more complicated picture. So I'm gonna list a number of things here. Some of these have happened, some of these have happened and been challenged, and some of these are aspirational. When you take them in total, they are actually an agenda. We've seen the you know, zeroing out of the individual mandate, the end of cost sharing reductions, implementations of alternative to ACA plans like short-term limited duration insurance plans and association health plans. Things like you know, providing states the opportunity to be able to do different things with their Medicaid programs, inclusive of using work requirements. We've seen the repeal of taxes on healthcare providers, healthcare insurance, you know, device taxes. We've seen those go away. We've seen this administration talk a lot about price transparency and look extensively into a number of corners of the provider space to talk about price transparency. We've seen CMMI you know, do innovative things with kidney care models. We've looked at, on the drug pricing side, the opportunity to, for Americans to get you know, drug prices similar to what they would get in other countries, the opportunity for reimportation, the elimination of PBM rebates and the effect they have on prices, a very targeted attack on insulin prices, that a commitment to do something about surprise billing and come hell or high water, the commitment to protect pre-existing conditions. Now, one thing you can say about that agenda is that it varies based on your perspective of how much that is real or not. Um, and I'm very certain that my friend Andy will speak a different truth. 
But one thing I think is really important to think about for a second term is that unlike the Bush and Obama terms beforehand, where they had a signature first term accomplishment that they then had to implement the Part D drug benefit or the Affordable Care Act generally, this administration will work with a much cleaner sheet if they have a second term. Uh, let me just push you for a second. Doesn't the fact that they have a cleaner sheet mean that they haven't done very much, actually, that the, all the things you mentioned don't really amount to a lot if it's a clean sheet? That's the first part. The second part is, do you think we're going to get anything more serious about drugs? He did promise in 2018 that we would have reference pricing to other countries, but we really haven't seen that implemented. So clean sheet and the opportunity to take some of these aspirational uh, these aspirational policies and deliver on them. Again, there's a long way from actually doing it, and some of those in that list have actually been done versus following through with them. And I'll openly acknowledge that that is the case, but the door is still open for them in a second term. And on that, what do you think about drug prices? Do you think he's, he would be serious about that and actually do something? I mean, he's waffled. He was very serious pre uh, uh, the election in 2016. Then it sort of got lost um, because I think his advisors told him, we'll do that third. Um, uh, but, you know, we haven't really seen serious reduction in any drug costs. I, th I think that we will have the opportunity for legal action and serious billable hours as people challenge the actions they will take, because I don't think we'll get long into a second term before they actually th go forward with you know, some of these um, executive orders as actual real regulations and then we'll have then we'll have some fights andy if joe biden gets elected what do you think we can expect and in that regard how much do you think is going to be health care reform without COVID? you know to be honest it hasn't been a core focus of uh joe biden um but will he be forced to make it a major issue yeah, look, I, I think the first um, the first question is it's hard to answer without COVID uh, because I think COVID is sort of anchors healthcare policy in some regards. Yeah, I mean, if Biden is smart, and what he appears to be doing is he's essentially uh, treating this as this is a job application to say who should be managing the country's pandemic response. But in the same way, in 2008, um, we had two people running to see who should be hired to run uh, us out of the financial crisis. And, you know, fortunately, um, both we have experience in this country with both candidates having managed a pandemic crisis. Um, uh, obviously, President Trump with COVID-19, uh, Joe Biden with Ebola. And so you have at least a little bit of a flavor of their approaches. Uh, and I think they're, they're the contrast. And, you know, of course, we've lived through um, this year most recently. So people will be able to judge and who they want to hire, who they think brings the competence, the compassion, the plan, uh, et cetera. Um, and I think first and foremost, um, Biden is very likely to be about um, a couple things. Uh, one uh, is making sure that um, we have a um, more unifying approach, uh, which is a very hard challenge, uh, but much more a capability throughout the country, testing, contact tracing, um, uh, that we have uh, ability for people to um, who get sick to have paid medical leave. And um, so I think he's got a very specific vision that is kind of more close to what people in the rest of the world have um, have executed. And, and in deference to Rodney, um, probably what a, a Mitt Romney uh, or, or, or a George W. Bush or a Larry Hogan or a Charlie Baker would be executing. You know, I don't think that there's a particularly Democrat or Republican response to the pandemic. I think there's a good response and a bad response. But I think it requires commitment and thoroughness. And um, I think you'd get that uh, probably from Biden. Um, you know, I think his aspirations on healthcare side are, are interesting. Um, you know, I think the, the, the cracks that have appeared because of COVID-19, um, such as, you know, the massive health equity issues, such as some of the holes in our infrastructure, such as, um, some of the ways that um, insurers were left holding the money and care providers were left holding the bag, um, such as the, the um, inexorable link between employment and insurance, which hurt a lot of people when they lost their jobs. I mean, those are all those are all opportunities for repair work. It, it's likely to come in the form of something that some might view as incremental, 
because I don't think um, I don't think it's his intention to um, uh, to try to run a very partisan. Um, uh, if, should, should he win, I think he will have as one of his goals to try to unify the country, to try to bring Republicans on board. Whether he'll be successful, that no idea. But I think that's how he thinks of himself. And so I think he would probably build from where we are. Um, now, if the court case, uh, California, Texas, goes against California and he controls the Congress, then he will he will obviously have that as a first bit of legislation uh, to work on. And that bit of legislation um, to, to, to correct things would be would be an approach. Now, if there's a mixed mixed Congress and Biden is president, that's a very different um, scenario. And I think, quite honestly, not a lot gets done uh, in that scenario, including a replacement plan. Um, but but I think his intent um, is clearly to try to get as many people covered as possible. His intent is to do it in a way that feels less um, feels more durable because he, he brings more people along in the process. And and I just might maybe add one more thing. I think Harris uh, Harris as a vice president, to the extent that she chooses initiatives. Health equity, and you know, I invite Daniel to, Daniel to uh, opine on this because he's an expert in this topic. That's a very important um, focus for hers, and I think to the extent that she has an initiative that the president allows her to kind of run with, that might be one of them. And what, do you, what if you were to look forward, what are the kind of reforms he could do without a major piece of legislation that you would think be at the top of his list. Would it be drug prices? Um, would it be surprise medical billing? What, what do you think gets up there? And, and how is he going to handle the fact that the uninsured rate keeps going up without legislation? Well, I think he learned last night that you can do anything you want with an executive order. Uh, so it's, I mean, as I, I think it's a tweet on fancy stationery. Um, uh, and look, both, 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 both parties have, have done this. So this is not a, this is not just a knock against uh, what the president's done, but it, but it is a little bit in that it's a little, sort of an eleventh hour uh, statement. Look, there's a lot that can be done um, uh, through regulation, uh, actual regulation, not executive order. Uh, and I think uh, prescription drug costs. I think he'll actually do something um, as opposed to kind of the, the rhetoric. And I think Rodney you know, very kindly acknowledged that the Trump has said a lot of the things that you know his old boss Chuck Grassley has said, uh, but has not really um, in any way. Um, taken on any kind of have to, to create any legislation or to get anything uh, done. Um, and I think it will be challenging. But I think there's probably enough um, since, since the end of Obama's term and in Trump's term, a few things are, are kind of formed a little bit of consensus around Medicare Part B drugs, some of the things around rebates, et cetera. Um, I think it's entirely possible um, that we ha- we may be at a point where over the next four years there is enough consensus to do something on drug costs. Um, you know, the Democrats' agenda is also, I think, um, likely to be coming out of this focus on mental health. Um, I hope it is. Um, that's that's going to be a, a significant uh, crying need. Um, and um, and so, you know, yes, there'll be smaller things. I mean, I hate to say surprise medical bills are a small thing uh, because they impact so many people. But, you know, I, I think he will have you know, bigger thrusts. I think he will be more, you, you may have a view on this, I think he will be uh, more supportive of the NIH, more supportive of rebuilding the CDC, uh, more more supportive of putting us in a position um, where um, if he's a transitional figure, he will be focused on what can I do now so that the next 10 or 20 years when we have uh, other threats, other pandemics, et cetera, that we're more prepared for. Um. Uh, Dr. Dawes, I want to ask you uh, a question. You know, COVID has exposed, it didn't create by any stretch of the imagination, exposed lots and lots of disparities. We've got a huge disparity of coverage, despite the ACA narrowing differences on coverage between whites and African-Americans and Hispanics. There are still large disparity coverage uh, differences. There are obviously big differences in access to care, even once you have insurance. And there are big, big difference in health uh, disparities in health outcomes among African Americans and whites. I will just note one that you know just boggles my mind. If you look at the mortality rate of whites, 15% of the mortality from COVID-19 is in people under 65. On the other hand, in African Americans, it's 30%. Um, so much 
uh, different and, and just taking away many, many more younger lives among the African-American community. What do you think the agenda is to address these disparities after the election? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emanuel, for that. And I just want to build upon what uh, Andy was uh, talking about. I fully support all that he mentioned. I think one of the things that um, I have noticed uh, with uh, the Biden campaign is that they have taken a robust health equity lens to their work. And I think that's really important. It's the first time in U.S. history that we've had such a robust um, prioritization of health equity in um, health policies, so in proposed policies. So let me let me just talk about quickly this triple pandemic that we're in. Uh, we all know, besides the COVID uh, pandemic, that our country is experiencing a moment of racial and social reckoning, as well as mental and behavioral uh, crises, as um, Andy mentioned, right? And I think that we'd be remiss to not try and codify some health equity reforms early on in a Biden administration, reforms to center equity and policies intended to increase access to care, uh, to improve the quality and the value of care, which we haven't seen really, and, and address the determinants of health. There were 62 provisions in the Affordable Care Act that were focused on the advancement of health equity. And many of them, though, have not been implemented or enforced, or some of them haven't, have been actually undermined, right, uh, during the course of, of time, to such a degree uh, that we need to spend time, as Andy was saying, to repair those and build on those uh, moving forward. So I'd love to see the conversation uh, focused on that really in a robust manner. I think uh, Andy's comments about mental health is justified in light of the fact that, um, you know, we know that over the next 20 years, the life expectancy in this country is expected to decline 21 places to 64th. And a main uh, reason for that is because of uh, behavioral health issues, mental illness and substance use disorders, addiction and suicidality and so forth. So we, we have to, um, you know, really push that mental health equity agenda uh, moving forward. And then I also think what's also inspiring is to see that there is a lot of great work going on at a lot of our, a lot of our historically black medical schools uh, where resources could really create a lasting impact. And so bringing those um, institutions into the fray, I think, would be helpful. So let me actually address now the component that you mentioned. You talked about uh, on insurance uh, rate growing, Medicaid growing, um, and what would we do about the uninsured, right? Just last week, the Census Bureau released a report showing that nearly 30 million Americans lacked health coverage in 2019. We know that after President Obama left office, uh, that uh, during the Trump administration, we have seen uh, health, uh, the uninsurance rate continue to grow year after year. The uninsured rate rose to 29.6 million people uh, back in 2019, uh, totaling 9.2% of the population. And that was up from 28.1 million at the end of 2016. And at the same time, we see Medicaid enrollment uh, falling from 17.9% to 17.2%. So we have to keep in mind, this is all before factoring COVID. The huge numbers of unemployment we've already seen uh, could possibly and could possibly see uh, as we move forward with businesses grappling with their existence in the new normal. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised in the least bit if next year's numbers show the continued trend of the uninsured rate picking up. So to combat that, I think we have to take a long, hard look at the most effective ways to decrease the cost burden associated with health insurance for many of these vulnerable groups, and then subsequently increase access to it. So uh, let me push you on that for a second. Um, I agree we're gonna see a big increase, uh, both in the number of people on Medicaid and the number of people who are uninsured. What do you think a new Biden administration does about it unless they make it a focus and have major legislation which carries its own political risks? So I, I, I don't see us doing a comprehensive uh, health policy like we did with the Affordable Care Act. I think there may be opportunities uh, to do fixes. I think um, his ideas for, you know, expanding Medicare to a certain uh, population uh, group, those 55 to 65 perhaps, that would help. Um, especially when you're dealing with a protected class of employees that, um, you know, are let go at higher rates and um, have higher rates of uh, pre-existing conditions. So I think that would be a great piece. I think, you know, this uh, coalition to 
to move these states that haven't expanded Medicaid. I think that would be uh, helpful. I think also perhaps revisiting the notion of incentivizing these states that have refused to expand Medicaid by saying that we will fully pay for it then, we'll grandfather you in and pay 100% of the cost for three years, uh, at least opening that up to them and, uh, and, and incentivizing. I think that would be extremely helpful. Rodney, um, let me ask you, last night we did have these executive orders. Um, a lot of people uh, unsure what exactly the legal regulatory uh, status of an executive order is. Um, can you unpack, do they, are, are they worth the paper they're written on? Um, and will it have any real impact on healthcare access uh, at all? Between now and November 3rd, they are going to be repeated over and over again as though they actually have happened. I think we all acknowledge that. Um, whether or not that is true is a very highly debatable concept. The one, though, that is the most fascinating one is the idea of these drug discount coupon cards. Um, I'm certain all of us have seen this swirling ever since it was announced. Um, that I think what we have is a battle between folks who um, would question that authority to find a legal case as to why the administration cannot do that, find a judge to issue a ruling the administration cannot do that before the administration does it. That I think is probably the most likely thing of anything last night to be real in the extraordinarily 39 day short term. Rodney, does that strike you as buying votes? Appealing to voters through oh, using, I, okay, if the House of Representatives- I, I'm just, you know, we got 40 <laughs> days left to go. I'm sending all you seniors $200 in the mail. What does that sound like to you? Oh, yes, it, it certainly, yep, it smells like it. It, it, it. it quacks like it. Yeah, you have every reason to say that. But I will say, you know, if the House of Representatives this afternoon could pass a bill that gave every seniors $200 before election day, they probably would. Uh, Erica, do you think this is going to uh, change attitudes? Uh, or do you think this is a matter of cynicism uh, out there about this? I don't know that it changes attitudes. I, I do think the one very consistent thing and for anyone who has followed the Kaiser Family Foundation's health polling data is that the views about the Affordable Care Act have been very stable and very consistent with the exception of when they were under attack, in which case they become more, it became more favorable uh, and it has and has stayed there. So certainly partisanship is the overwhelming dimension here and your partisanship will color the way that you view the administration's actions. I think the key question is how, you know, those very few uh, undecideds and swing voters take it. And then certainly there will be, I think from a both political and health communication perspective, concern about the variety of misinformation that we are likely to see surrounding the issue. And that is a challenge uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, not the least of which it's challenging to to uh, uh, combat in in any cycle, but especially this cycle. So um, again, uh, I don't want to be too cynical. You know, I reserve that for my brother, who's the politician. But you know, two hundred dollars to people over sixty five um, strikes me as uh, got Florida written all over it. How many over sixty fives in Florida are really undecided that this might sway? I, I mean, I think that's that's exactly the question. And it's certainly, I mean, seniors are a key category for both parties and certainly costs, uh, healthcare costs uh, are a bipartisan concern. You see those appearing in both uh, advertising from both parties. I do think that, uh, in, you know, what exactly comes in those messages? We've seen a lot of uh, messaging from the Trump administration that puts its name all over it. In in many ways, I think that cuts both ways for them because people who receive, for example, uh, information with the Trump name on it are going to throw it away and not necessarily look at it. Depends on on how that's received and what the information is that surrounds it. Interesting, a Andy. Um, you were uh, uh, for. Uh, several years head of uh, CMS ran Medicare and Medicaid 
Um, and one of the things a pandemic has shown is that we, you know, medicine can switch when stress, we can, you know, all those doctors on the sideline not doing telemedicine, suddenly everyone's doing telemedicine. Uh, the rate of elective procedures can go way down. Um, uh, but they do have, all of those changes have some financial costs and really stressed hospitals, especially inner city hospitals and rural hospitals. Looking into your crystal ball, what are the changes induced by the pandemic do you think are going to continue? And what kind of uh, policies, regulatory or legislative, do you think might be um, used to keep the good stuff going forward, like more telemedicine? Sure. Do you mind if I start on the tail end, just of the last question you you, you had um, about seniors? And if, if I minded, would it make a difference, Andy? Of course. Go ahead, because it, your perspective would be useful. Um, so seniors need to understand that under under President Obama and Joe Biden, um, the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, which is what allows Medicare to stay afloat, it was expanded by 10 years. And um, under President Trump, it's just declined another two years. And so that it now expires, it doesn't expire technically, but it, it becomes insolvent in 2024 during the next administration. That's wholly irresponsible to seniors. This latest proposal that he's proposing would come directly out of the Medicare trust fund to reduce it even further. So he's, you know, he's, if he's going to give somebody something, he's doing it with their own money and their own future. And, you know, seniors ought to be very concerned about that because if you have the Medicare trust fund expiring during your term, what it basically does is it puts you in a position that I think the president would like to be in, which is to say, I have got to reform it in order to save it. And reform is code, in this case, for reduction in, in Medicare benefits um, and putting caps on Medicare benefits. And we should just all remember that in 1965, before Medicare, one in three seniors lived below the poverty level. That's now 8%. We take it for granted. It's a generational promise. He's playing games, just like he is with Social Security, by saying he's going to eliminate payroll taxes, uh, which would take Social Security trust fund down to 2023. So um, I think seniors are going to be smart enough to not fall for that. Having said that, you know, Tr Trump's great skill is as a marketer. And sending this card out is, is, is probably will be effective with some people. Um, you know, the, the, so thank you for allowing me to do that. The, 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 well, I thought that was a helpful perspective, I think, and a lot of useful information. Okay, great. Um, so your, your question uh, is, a, is a great question because um, I think there are um, a couple of things that we looked at. Systems are good when they're resilient and they're bad when they exacerbate problems. The healthcare system, in a lot of ways, exacerbated problems. It exacerbated disparities. Um, it exacerbated the challenges of people who, um, lost their jobs and couldn't get access to healthcare. And as you pointed out, it exacerbated um, the burden on small physician practices at clinics uh, and hospitals, community hospitals, rural hospitals. And so that should tell us something that if we're willing to face it, uh, we've got a system we can make more resilient. And we can make it more resilient, I think, in three principal ways. Um, one is not making health equity an overlay to the system uh, but making it a part of the core construct and baking it in. That's not easy. That requires uh, a lot of work and a lot of challenging old assumptions and challenging conversations. But if we have those conversations, it can be a dramatically good thing that comes out of this. Second is the tie between um, employment and insurance. And obviously the ACA was an effort to address that in some way, but not completely. Um, I think for the next generation of people who work in the gig economy and work in Amazon warehouses and don't get the kind of benefits that, that we all did and that our parents' generation did, um, it's going to be necessary to figure something out there and have that dialogue. And then the third one, which I think the one you asked about, is very interesting um, because, in effect, what we've learned is our intermediaries um, were able to benefit in this fee-for-service system when, when utilization went down, and the people that... We care about, not that we don't care about insurance companies, but we care about them in a different way than we care about the people that actually provide our medical care. Those are the people, when we think of healthcare, that we think of insurance companies, they, they enable it, they, they pay the claims, they do a bunch of other things. But there's an argument then to be made for a few things, more virtual care, as you said, 
uh, more um, uh, capitation type payments, payments um, particularly in rural areas. And I think there may even be some consensus, some bipartisan consensus that, you know, you could start to pay rural hospitals um, on a per capita basis uh, for at least some of their care, um, that there may be uh, things uh, uh, that are uh, all payer rates and other kinds of things that are boring to the general public, very interesting to people like us, um, but that but that there may be a, a, a call for an opportunity for. And those things, generally speaking, unless we threw that up, aren't that controversial. In other words, they're not that they're not that partisan ideas. They're just sort of pragmatic ideas. I, I think everybody would like to see telemedicine continue. Then you, you always have to ask yourself, okay, well, who would who who who's who who would be against that? And the answer is, you know, if the the physicians that are able to do it now across state lines, right? So for years you've got all these licensing requirements. If you're a doctor in North Carolina, you've got your competition limited. If all of a sudden anybody from anywhere in the country can do virtual service to people in North Carolina, not so much. So I think you'll see um, people who are kind of for it in spirit, but then start to draw lines like we always do about how does this um, impact uh, my my feet of my domain. And I n- never underestimate the ability when money's involved for people to push back. Um, Rodney, can I ask you about uh, an issue that uh, Andy just raised, but raised more forcefully earlier on, and that that's the – potential for bipartisanship if Biden wins um, and if uh, uh, Trump loses, and especially if uh, the Senate flips, even if it flips to 50-50 or uh, 51-49, it's very close. Um, How do you think that's going to affect Republican senators um, in their willingness to engage? Um, Will it mean that they're going to actually try to embrace bipartisanship or are they going to adopt the same position they had during Obama and some people might even say during Clinton, which is, um, you know, this is a war and we're going to continue to try to undermine this administration no matter what. And I ask that question in light of the fact that um, the whole first year is going to be, if not consumed by COVID, but COVID is going to be a dominant thing. and implementing a COVID vaccine and whatever else we need to do is going to be a, a major undertaking for whoever uh, the president is. So is there any hope for bipartisanship here? There's glass half full, glass half empty, and then I'm pretty much glass half full of battery acid. Um, I'm a skeptic. And it's because the Republican perspective is informed by the last 40 years of history which is Democrats have held the White House, the Senate, and and the House of Representatives for precisely four years, 93 and 94, 9 and 10. Both those ended badly. From a Republican perspective, there's going to be that leaning um, that way is that let Democrats overplay their hands, we'll be back in charge very shortly. I'm not endorsing that. I'm stating that. But I do think one of the things to remember is that even in the Affordable Care Act, which ended up being rather largely partisan as it went through the process, had bipartisan issues tucked in. Biosimilars, menu labeling, uh, the Physician Payment Sunshine Act. There were pieces throughout that that both sides could have very easily agreed upon separately. And that's not out of the realm of possible to occur in something that might happen in 21, even while um, it was very much um, a very partisan world during that time. Um, That's interesting. Uh, Do you think there's going to be enough bipartisanship for something like um, pharmaceutical price regulation, or do you think that's just going to be polarizing? I think that... um, I think that Republicans would very happily let the Democrats take on the pharmaceutical industry and deal with the slings and arrows and stand out of their way. So no bipartisanship on that major issue that Americans care about. Um, Erica, do you see it the same way when you look at the polling data? I think I do see it the same way. I think we see, uh, you know, again, bipartisan discussion of costs. Everyone is concerned about rising costs and wants to or or claims that they will work to bring costs down. It's pro-democratic messages, though, that go after opponents for their ties to the insurance company. And you really don't see that very much from the Republican side. And so 
it, it's also, by the way, this was one of the one of the only ways that Democrats talked about the ACA in the very oblique way that they did uh, pre 20. 2018 is that I stood up to the insurance companies. That was about as close as they used to get to touting their support for the Affordable Care Act. So it definitely, there is not um, robust support or love for pharmaceutical companies among the overall general public. So certainly I do think the the democratic attention to support uh, by insurance companies is a winning argument overall, but certainly there are money and politics considerations that are larger than even the public uh, here, and that does play a role in how we see it shape. Uh, Daniel, I wanted to ask you uh, again about how you're seeing um, uh, potential things like telemedicine, um, like the COVID vaccine issue, either ameliorate or exacerbate disparities? Are they part of the solution? Or in the end, is this going to be, unfortunately, they're built on a substructure of a institutionally uh, racist uh, health system. And until we change that system, uh, it's going to be very hard to get, uh, get chain reforms uh, to really uh, address the disparities issue. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So, you know, I really want us as a country to view the fight for addressing health disparities as an and problem, not an or problem. And I agree with Andy when he says it's not about overlaying it, uh, the issue of equity, but, you know, basically entrenching it, right? Because we know that structural racism has been entrenched, has been concretized in systems and programs of policy. So we have to do a better job there. Uh, by that, I mean, I want us to shift our perspective from thinking about spending time, money, and resources as focused on one determinant to the detriment of another, and instead employ a concerted effort to address the system as a whole. So we can try and fix uh, health care and housing and employment. To that end, I believe the most uh, prescient approach to take, especially given the fact that November 3rd is right around the corner is to address the political determinants of health. If we can take and take on the upstream factors, right, that have downstream effects, we can really start to move the needle of health equity forward. And we can do so without leaving out any particular issue. For every issue that we can think of, housing, nutrition, equal pay, uh, there is a corresponding political determinant that led to that issue. So whether it's city council ordinance impacting housing or a state or federal legislative decision empowering, you know, pay disparities, if we can engage and motivate our electorate to see that political decisions impact their health, that these decisions will dictate how long we live on this earth and the quality of life that we'll have on this earth especially for these vulnerable and marginalized communities, then, then I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to see greater traction on these issues and, um, and one day realize a more healthy, equitable, and inclusive society. Um, let me push you on that because <laughs> it sounded to me, and I, this is what I want to verify and maybe you want to elaborate, you were pushing an issue which is, look, um, if we really want to address the disparities, we have to look outside the healthcare system and really address things that we often don't anneal to healthcare and, and health outcomes, but are really important, like housing, like employment, like transportation. Um, it, it, is that really what you're saying? Because I, I, I believe that, you know, almost all, I'm an oncologist and everyone thinks, you know, it's like, uh, uh, it's, it's not about the environment, but we know that the environment actually, you know, uh, controls 40 to 60 percent of uh, cancer cases. Um, uh, is that really the direction you are suggesting uh, a new administration goes in? Well, I, I certainly uh, think that uh, we know there are, you know, social and environmental determinants of health, as you mentioned, and they play an outsized role in our overall health. We, we also know, you know, from studies from the National Academy of Medicine that uh, when you think about the 30 years that we've added onto our life expectancy, Five of those years are attributed to healthcare. So healthcare is important. It's not an or for me, it is an and. Uh, we're talking about healthcare and these other determinants. 
in, in one study that we did at the Satchel Health Leadership Institute, we found that between 1990 and 2000, or 1991 and 2000, when we looked at the data, healthcare data, that with all of the technological advancements that we've realized, you mentioned telehealth and others, right? But with all of these advancements that we realized during that period, about 176,000 lives were saved. If we had taken an equity lens to that work, in healthcare alone, almost 900,000 African-American lives would have been saved. So as we are expanding our purview on these issues and we're thinking and we're moving uh, further upstream, right? Looking at these factors that play an outsized role. Imagine if we took uh, an approach with, of health equity in all public policies, in all of these social determinants, understanding and connecting the political roots of these social determinants, right? Or these social determinants to their political roots and understanding how these are driven, how these drive the inequities, how they perpetu perpetuate and exacerbate the inequities in our society. So it's an and for me. Uh, and I think it's something that we have to look at across the board. Andy, you began in your first response to me talking about you think Joe Biden is going to try to heal the country, bring it together and uh, uh, reach out across the aisle in his major initiatives. Um, I have no doubt that's the person he is. But if Rodney is right, uh, that's going to be spurned again. Uh, does that suggest to you a diff that uh, it's important to take a different strategy? Or do you think that trying bipartisanship is going to be an important thing for the uh, if Biden gets elected? Well, I think he may be. Well, he'll certainly make his effort with Republican senators and Congress people, but I think where he'll really be focused is on mainstream day-to-day -day Republicans um, living in the country and trying to communicate that he's their president too, regardless of whether they voted for him. I just think that's who he is. I don't think that's um, a, a strategy. I don't think that's a, um, uh, a tactic. I think that's actually how he sees himself and what he thinks the country needs right now. Um, now, he will obviously be pulled because there are progressive forces on the Democratic side that will want him to take advantage of every opportunity to uh, what Rodney might call um, go too far um, from one lens or you know make up for lost time or right wrongs that were done during the Republican administration. There'll be all, all that kind of pressure. And I'm not suggesting it's, it's going to be easy, but I would just say on balance, if he's sitting in the off, Oval Office every day and he's thinking about kind of what is my mental model, I think he feels like he could do the most good by healing the country, not necessarily passing every piece of legislation that comes across uh, his desk. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough and imperfect trade-off, but I will tell you, um, you know, <laughs> there were not a lot of Republican senators and Congress people who particularly liked President Obama. Um, they didn't have a relationship with him. They, but I will tell you, every time I went over to the Hill, um, people always had... Not, Republican senators who knew him always had nice things to say, kind things to say about Joe Biden um, as a person, and I think they trust him. Um, so is that is that guarantee um, success? Absolutely not. Does it give him a starting point? Um, is he the kind of person that would invite people who he dis who disagreed with him over to the White House to spend time um, listening to them and building relationships? I think more so than President Obama, more so than President Trump, uh, more so than George W. Bush. Um, he would be inclined uh, to do that. Erica, do you think he has room to do that? Um, or is that really not going to matter? And I guess my real underlying question is, how much of the electorate is movable, uh, as it were, um, or are we locked into this for, you know, another election cycle? Are you yes. going to make us depressed, in other words? <laughs> well, I hope not, because I do want to remain somewhat optimistic that there are ways to move the conversation. I mean, I do think he has some some room. I think certainly, uh, uh, you know, there are there are real issues in our country that deserve to be addressed. And there are um, areas where the public is unified in in looking for resolutions, certainly. Um, protections for pre-existing conditions are are one of those sort of key areas. If we if we um, do indeed find movement on the Supreme Court later this year, so I, I think there is room for him to do that. And I think 
you know, there was a question in one of the Q&As about, you know, is there room for messaging that can get beyond the divisiveness? Yes, absolutely. I do think there are. And I think there are organizations out there like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who are putting in efforts to try to uncover, you know, messaging that can cut through the partisanship and and move the conversation towards um, maybe not using equity uh, as, as a term specifically, um, but certainly that would move us in a health equity direction. So I do, I want to be optimistic about it, but I do, I'm also a realist and as a political scientist, I do have to say that, you know, partisanship is the overwhelming dimension here. And certainly there is very little that uh, partisans can do to convince opposing partisans <laughs> that their actions are in their best interest. So I will, maybe I will just leave it there. Uh, Rodney, um, question for you on the COVID response. Um, uh, if President uh, Trump gets elected, uh, what do we think, uh, do we think we're gonna get a, a beefed up COVID response from him uh, around getting the vaccine out? Um, or, um, and again, I don't want to be too partisan, but it's hard to give him anything but a middling or poor grade on his implementation and COVID response, or, or are we you know, in for more of the same? Um, I think one of our biggest problems is ourselves. Um, let me say something controversial and then feel free to tell me how wrong I am. Um, <laughs> I think that we have a very fundamental problem, and that is that we as Americans, are not individually responsible enough for us to be collectively responsible enough as Americans. Um, and we see this every day in our behavior. And that uh, I think the challenge that any administration, no matter who uh, wins on November 3rd, is going to still be trying to affect the behavior of Americans uh, and how they treat this. And that we watch it every day. How many times do you find yourself in situations where you find, look at somebody and go, put on a freaking mask already. Uh, I mean, that there's, yes, absolutely, uh, there are things that could be done to more forcefully push that. But, you know, we got to do some you know, time in front of mirrors before we want to point fingers at what is necessarily a government action. Well, on that score, though, don't, don't you think um, the government could, you know, help us along, as it were, if, you know, the chief executive modeled the right behavior. I noticed that the uh, United States Postal Service was going to send out a package of five face masks to every household. Um, don't, don't you think those kind of, uh, you know, you might dismiss them as gestures, but you also might say, well, it does send a very strong message to people about what the normal right behavior is. No, and, uh, I'm not going to argue that we have modeled behavior well for people at all. Um, that I think that you've seen that. I think that um, this guy Woodward wrote a book about it, or at least featured prominently in it. Now, some hack in here in D.C. has said, you know, has written a book or two. I mean, look, there's no question that that more could be done. Um, but again, you know, how we handle it and what we need um, to feel uh, this this constant sense of normalcy. You know, you know, come hell or high water, I'm going to Starbucks. I mean, the, that uh, we are putting ourselves constantly in situations to try to achieve some level of normalcy uh, because uh, it's who we are, even if you know, we're taking risks in doing so that we don't have to do. All right. I'm going to uh, go around in our last few minutes, ask everyone if you had to give one or two pieces of advice uh, to the new president about what you think would be best for the country to do. And I mean, I mean not politically best, but best for the country. Uh, starting January 20th, um, what would you do? Andy, what are your two pieces of advice? You know, the advice I would give if President Trump were to, were to win re-election, just very strictly on the pandemic is, I think he, um, I think there's something about his character which causes him to feel like he's gotta tell a glossy, happy story to the public. Um, and that to some extent that maybe he feels like he'd be blamed uh, for the pandemic. Um, the, 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 I mean, we've been living with bugs and viruses for centuries. Uh, he did not invent this. Um, and I think if he approached this with um, an understanding that the public can handle um, hearing the truth with a light, the light at the end of the tunnel, but not false hope, um, he would do far better. And I think that's true both for the country and politically. Rodney's absolutely right. This is tough for people to go through. But you know what? You know where it's not tough? Africa. In Africa, 
continent of 1.3 billion people, there's only been 30,000 deaths. We have to ask ourselves why. And part of the reason is because the rest of the world is used to these things. And simple instructions like, hey, don't breathe on one another are not that complicated. Um, and and so it does require a set of leadership, leadership traits because we haven't done it before. And you have to be willing to, as you said it exactly right, Zeke, modeling behavior, those are not small things. Um, in a public health crisis, before you have a vaccine, your communication with public is your medicine. And getting that wrong has been very costly. And I think it's not out of his grasp if he would just stop taking it personally. Um, you know, for, 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 for Biden, um, if he wins, I think his biggest challenge is going to be to unify um, the, the, the country in messaging because, um, you know, um, vaccines are good things. They're not good. They're not, they're not bad things when they went under President Trump and good things under President Biden. They're good things when they're ready and the FDA says they're ready. And, and making people feel and understand um, that this is that this is not political, it's apolitical, is a very hard challenge these days. I think it's easier in the real world than it is in Washington, but I still think it's a challenge. And my advice to him is highly communicative, highly transparent, um, and and to to run with those instincts. I've seen him in these kinds of crises before. He's good. Uh, he surrounds himself with good people like you, and that will serve him well. Daniel, you're up next. So for me, I think it is putting people first, right? Harnessing that power of collaboration to effect the changes that are so necessary for our economic and national security interests. And I think my advice uh, for him would be to understand those implications of uh, trying to divide uh, population groups in this country to continue to stoke uh, those tensions among different population groups and understand what that has meant over the history of our country. They do have very serious implications. So that would be my advice. Great. Erica. Yeah, I think I would second the things that have been said. I do think that a lot, uh, a lot of what is really needed is more messaging and more unifying messaging. There are many places where Americans agree and we can find more common ground if, if we, uh, instead of looking at just one side of an aisle as being our constituents, we think about the, the country as a whole. I also do agree with Andy that the, you know, research and trust in experts and science and in medicine is, is very, very important. And there need to be ways that we, uh, bipartisan ways, that we continue to shore up that trust in uh, those institutions, acknowledging the uncertainty and being realistic about where we are, but also continuing to shore up and amplify their messaging. Almost, I mean, I think this is the challenge always in political and health uh, communication areas is that you really do want to forefront the, the health experts rather than the political experts. Certainly the political experts have to make some hard decisions, but everything we know suggests we should be putting those health and science experts to the foreground and uh, because people are more inclined to listen to them than they are to the partisans on either side of the aisle. Rodney, clean well, up, not, two pieces of I, advice. I'm not going to be so arrogant as to think that I or anybody else can tell the president um, anything. So let me focus then on the um, on uh, Biden and if he were to win. And my advice would be straightforward, which is that after the last four years, we are at a precipice on tribalism in this country on a political level, and that uh, that he has a, a choice, which is to uh, listen to the left most who need revenge on the folks on the who have run the last four years and want the country to be run that way, or he can try to be, as Andy, I think, pointed out, uh, find a way to, to find more middle ground and to push those that were, are only going to see things through a partisan lens further and further to the sides. Because if he doesn't, oh, I'm not certain that four more years of this doesn't end up in a, a, some, in a place where all truth is partisan, which means there is no truth. Wow. Um, interesting. Uh, uh, so much focus for a health policy seminar on communication and, and getting the right message to the country. With that, I thank all of our panelists uh, for a great presentation and pass it back over to uh, uh, Professor Rachel Warner.
Thank you. Thanks again to all the panelists. It was a terrific conversation. Thank you, Zeke, for your moderation. I hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. And stay tuned for our upcoming seminars. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.